Great. Welcome to the 24th Annual Capital Conference. My name is the Virtual Edition. It's our goal that each session is about an hour in length. However, we may go a little longer or we may go shorter. My name is David Stevens. I'm the Director of Academics for UIL. Also helping with this session is Glenda Mignos, our Administrative Assistant for UIL Academics, who you've often heard from, maybe you've never seen, but here's your chance. Um, the session is Accounting Coaching Strategies. Our presenter is Susan Matthews. Susan is uh, retired from Magnolia High School several, a couple of years ago and was in a very successful accounting coach throughout the years. And it was my honor to get to present to her the UIL Sponsor Excellence Award before she retired. So uh, we're happy to have you, Susan, and thank you for being willing to share your wisdom and knowledge with our attendees in this new format of Capital Conference. Well, thank you so much, David. I'm glad to be here. And hello to everyone that's in attendance. Uh, you know, I'm a lot like most of you. I spend a lot of my time, even in the summer, getting ready for that next school year and uh, spend a lot of time working in uh, teaching and UIL coaching over the years and have done a lot of different things. And I know we've all gone through a lot of changes through the years and we've had to do things a little bit different year after year, but I don't think I've ever faced quite what you guys are facing right now with what's going on in our world. However, it does bring something to mind that one of my principals shared with us and whenever we would get antsy about maybe something new that was coming into the district, his motto was, change is inevitable, but misery is optional. So we all have a choice about how we're gonna move through a lot of these changes. Um, and hopefully there's a wide range of experience in the audience. I don't know who all is out there. Uh, some of you may be brand new, some of you may have years of experience, and some of you may know a lot of things that I'm going to share, and some of you probably have a lot of other great ideas as well. I'm just going to try to share with you some of the things that seem to work for our program and allowed my kids the opportunity to be as successful as possible. Uh, like David said, I have had a long career in UIL. I've coached for about 16 years. I was a coordinator for the UIL academics at our high school for four years. And now I've been working with Laverne at the state meet for the uh, last couple of years. And yes, I have had very, very wonderful children through the years and they've allowed me to have quite a lot of uh, success. Uh, the reason I share that with you is that it didn't all happen at one time. The, the first time uh, I remember going to the state meet I remember how anxious the kids were and not to say how anxious I was and then getting into the coaches meeting with Laverne and of course Laverne's asking us to volunteer and I'm like volunteer I don't want to volunteer I, I came here to have my kids compete and but of course if you haven't met Laverne you will and you'll find out that you definitely will be volunteering I volunteered that year to be part of the test review group and the reason I share that with you is especially if you're a new coach. I remember going into that room and starting to review the test with the other coaches. And I remember getting nauseated, literally thinking I probably was going to throw up because I knew that my students were in the other room taking this test. And I knew as a young coach that I definitely had not really prepared them because I will be honest, I had no idea what they were gonna be faced with at that state meet. And when they came out, they had pretty long faces and there was pretty much defeat written all over their, their, their expressions. And so we, we quickly realized that we were gonna have to do something a little bit different if we were going to have some success. And so a lot of what I'm gonna share with you kind of grew off of that first experience at the state meet. But fortunately, as time went by, my students did excel and we were blessed with two, um, perfect scores at the state meet from one of our students. And this young man was just a character. And this is a note that he actually left Laverne at the state meet on his scrap paper. And again, Laverne is very diligent and she goes through everything. And she saved this and sent a copy of that to me after the state meet when he was able to do that. I will tell you the thing that has probably been the biggest eye-opener for me in coaching these students is that you need to look at their preparation for a UIL academic meet no different from a one-act play that's preparing to go do their performance, a basketball team ready to play their ball game, and I would tell my kids this all the time, those students, whatever 
group they were a part of had something in common. Everybody was rehearsing. They were going over their plays or their lines and they were going over them over and over and over. Um, they had to practice, practice, practice. And they said those same lines over and over and over. Those basketball players did those same drills. They practiced those same throws. And so I started thinking to myself, that really isn't any different for our students. So what could I do to help them practice and rehearse and be ready? Well, one thing I did was I created what I call packets. My children eventually learned that these were their road to success. I actually took probably 10 years of Laverne's old test and I broke them down into topics. And as the students would start the school year, we would start working on the beginning packets because the packets were grouped and they progressively got harder as the school year went by. Also, there was a lot of just general information in a lot of the tests that were just asking them generalized questions, maybe not how to do something, but just information about something. So I also put together a lot of handouts that went over just general information. One thing Laverne really um, likes them to be is well-rounded, not just know how to do the mechanics, but also to become more aware of what accounting encompasses. And one of the favorite ones is this accounting handouts. And I remember the kids' biggest thing was they would find names on her test that were bogus names. She would put things on there that really weren't even accounting organizations. So we started adding to this list every year of bogus names that we would find that Laverne had put on maybe the test. So we had a lot of packets. The students actually logged the packets that they did. And over here on the left is the packet list that we would use when we were getting ready for invitational and district. So the students would check out a couple packets at a time. They would complete that packet. They would turn it in and they would get some coupons. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. So you're gonna see that there is a place here where they knew what their reward was going to be in the uh, concept of, of coupons. So we would do this. We, you can see how these packets progress through the school year and the concepts just get bigger and bigger and broader because most of you know by now that by the time you get to the district level, your students need to have finished the accounting cycle for a service business and for a merchandising business in order to truly be successful. So they're probably moving a little faster than your regular students. You can't expect your class to keep the same pace because all of the kids that are in your class aren't at the same motivation level as the kids that wind up being interested in your um, UIL materials. So the kids would keep track of the packets that they did. They would keep track of the handouts that they had become familiar with. On the back, they would take practice tests because like I said, the more they practiced, the more successful they were. And so we would have a place where they could go pull a test from prior years and they would take that practice test and then we would score it. So they had all the material that they could dream of in order to start getting themselves prepared. And then when it got closer to contests, uh, some of you may have access to this. I know you can still buy them used but Glencoe published something called uh, competitive event reviews. And they're just little great warmups. We would do these maybe before we would go to invitational meets or maybe we would do at the beginning of a practice session um, when we were at the meets, just something to kind of get the heads, the kids' heads into the ball game because you know, they, who knows what they had been doing before they got there or, or they probably weren't thinking about accounting. So we kind of needed to get them to be thinking about what it is that we were fixing to go do. So this has been a really good resource as well. And then if you're new, or even if you're not new, 
I hope that you are very familiar with the website that Laverne has added the link to the UIL Academic Accounting website. This is just a screenshot of that site, but hopefully you have found this. I didn't know it existed till after a very long time until I went to some of the capital conferences. I think that's how I actually was introduced to them. All the archive exams are here. All the contest statistics are there. <clears throat> and you're gonna have different students come across your path. I've got kids that live on this website looking up at her statistics just to see what the scores were and see if the kids are coming back next year and just kind of watching out for themselves. So those are some of the things, let me go back there. These are some of the things that we used in order to get the students ready. They need to understand the concepts. Um, in order for them to understand the concepts, I had to find materials that they could use that they would be willing to use and that they would take the time to use because all of you know this all can't happen in the classroom. So the students, you just had to find what works for your students, what you had time to do. I know you can buy a lot of different resources as well, so it's not that you have to put your own things together because there's plenty of things out there on the market that you're able to get your hands on. Uh, this is just the way that I had chose uh, to go about doing it. So once we did that, then these are some things that my students sh shared with me through the years that they felt like contributed somewhat to their success. And one of the things that I required my students to do, even though they didn't like doing it, is that they had to come in after a meet and we had to go over the test that they had just taken at that invitational meet or district meet or region meet, whatever meet it happened to be. Because if they don't go over the questions that they missed, then the chances of them missing that same topic of information is pretty big. So also what's really good about those, they were one-on-one -on -one sessions typically between me and one student. I could watch how they worked the problem and then I could show them a different way to work it. So it was a really good opportunity to show them different ways to attack a problem, as well as to see other ways to work problems because some of these students have really good insights on how they can go about attacking a problem that maybe as a coach you really never thought about. So it's a really good way for them to share with you and for you to share with them. The kids also learned to like the legibility code um, that Laverne put on the test. The main thing I think that they liked about it is it reminded them every time they got ready to take the test that they needed to pay attention to their handwriting. Uh, the worst thing in the world is for a student to miss a problem because the graders couldn't read his answer. So it's very important that from the very beginning, when you're grading their practice test, that you grade it wrong if it can't be read. It's just a good way for them to learn when it's not real costly. Another thing that I did with my students, I don't know, I'm probably kind of old fashioned because I kind of, I remember um, with my own children using flashcards at home. So that's just kind of how I'm wired. But, um, I made a lot of flashcards. I would, um, on this example, I had some cards that I had cut up, printed. They were on blue card stock, and all the account names were just written on the flashcards. And then in another color of flashcards, we would have different words on them. So they might have a stack of cards that have all of these different account names on them. They're all blue cards. And then they found a yellow card that said temporary and a yellow card that said permanent. And we did these as races because they like to compete. 
So I would say find your temporary and permanent card and sort all your accounts underneath the proper heading. So then, you know, they would start sorting their cards. It's a really good way for them to have to remember what accounts are temporary, what accounts are permanent. Then we'd use those same cards and then they would have to rearrange the stack and they would have to rearrange the accounts that had a normal debit balance on one side and the accounts that had a normal credit balance on the right side. So it's, it's using their hands and eyes and they're, they're not having to write and they're not having to read. They're just shuffling those cards around and they're competing with their partner or with their classmate. A really good way to review some of those regular types of activities. We would go on and then they would have another race where they would take those same account names and they would have to sort them by account classification. So again, they just shuffle those cards underneath the proper um, account classification name. Then we would go, as the year progressed, we would add more flashcards. So if you're on your worksheet, do these go on the balance sheet or do they go on the income statement section? If they do, do they go on the debit side or the credit side? So they, I was fortunate in my accounting room, my students actually sat at tables. So we had a lot of room to do these kinds of, of uh, activities because it does take a little bit of room. Then we did the income statement. If they were going to build an income statement, then we would uh, put the accounts in the order that they would appear. Post-closing trial balance, same thing, just you know, building the post-closing trial balance using those flashcards again. So those flashcards can be used for a lot of different reviews that cover a lot of concepts that are covered on the accounting contest. As the year went by, I made a new set of flashcards that encompassed a merchandising business. And then we would build the formulas for cost of goods sold, for net purchases, for the whole income statement. So those flashcards were really, really valuable all through the years as they were getting uh, ready for contests. One thing that I think is important for your students to understand is they'll be happy to know they can use their algebra in accounting. So they can finally find something that they able to apply that algebra uh, subject matter to. We use algebra equations to solve a lot of problems. I mean, we just, especially when it came to percentages, if you can put that into an algebra equation and solve for the unknown, you know, a lot of the questions simply are solving for an unknown. So setting things up into the algebraic equation and solving for the unknown is one good way that helped a lot of students uh, figure out different ways to attack a problem, especially when they're working on um, percentages, if you're working on the income statement and they know uh, the percent of gross profit, well then they can figure out the sales because if they take that back to 100% and solve for the unknown. So going back to that simple algebra equation can definitely help them solve a lot of different problems. And of course, the T account. I am a big stickler for the T account. I still use the T account. I have worked in accounting in the business world as many years as I have taught accounting. And I still work in the business world uh, in the accounting uh, area. I still use my T account. It's just an easy way to look at something and figure it out without trying to rebuild accounting from the ground up. I make my students use the T accounts. I force them to do entries into the T accounts. They have to proof things in their T accounts. It's just something that they are used to doing. So when they have a big problem and they're trying to figure something out, they know to go to that T account and typically it will help them solve the problem a whole lot easier. This next item is from a student, um, bullets. His big thing, or text, doesn't have to be bullets. A lot of the problems inside of the test include a wealth 
of information. One of the things that trips up a lot of the students is they lose track of what information they've used and what information they still need to take care of. So one of the things that one of my students really shared with the other uh, competitors is that as you use a piece of information, whether it's a sentence in a narrative or if it happens to be items that are listed as bullets, as he would take care of that little piece of information, he would draw a line through it. So he would know he had documented it, he'd already written it down, he knew he had taken care of it and that he could move on to the next piece of information. If it's when he gets finished, if everything has not been marked off, then that's a signal that when he starts reading the questions at the bottom, there's going to be something that probably you need to be careful about. And one of the, this, this problem was really a very interesting problem because if the students did not mark off the information when they were doing this problem, when they got to answer the last question, the last question asked them, what was the total gross earnings for the week for all 10 employees? If at that point they are keeping track of what they have done so far, they have only accounted for nine employees. If they had been marking off the information at the top, they would have found out that one of these questions did not talk about one of the 10 employees. So it is a really good idea to teach them to mark out the information as, as they have used it, and that will help them whenever they start answering the questions, they will then look up, they will see, oh, there's something there that's mar not marked out, and they will take that into consideration. Even if they've answered all the questions and they go back and see it, Maybe it's a piece of information they didn't need. Laverne likes to put some information in there that's just kind of there for fluff. So it doesn't always mean because it's not marked out that you've messed up, but if it's not marked out, you might wanna take a couple more seconds to look at it and make sure that it's not something that you need. So marking off your bullets, marking off the text as you go through it is something that really you can work with your students on to help them um, be more successful. One of the other things, and this is really hard, or it was for me to get my kids to skip a problem and move on. I have I spent a lot of time trying to convince them that sometimes if the problem looks really big, a lot of reading, lots of reading, lots of numbers, lots of information, and there are only three questions. So they can tell immediately when they start reading a lot of these big narratives what the topic is. This is payroll. And a lot of students have a hard time mastering payroll. For one thing, a lot of coaches can't even get to it until way into the spring semester. So if this is not an area where they are well rehearsed, and they're not um, quick with payroll, then this is a time when you just want to train them, skip it. This is three questions. Move on to the rest of the test. Wait till the very end. If you feel like you're going to have time at the very end, you can go back to it. So you have to teach them to weigh the value of the points versus the amount of time that they might use up trying to get that question answered. David, before I move on, do you have a reason that I need to pause? Um, at this point, we do not have any questions that have been submitted in the chat box, so you must be very clear. Okay, well, we will keep going. Okay, so now you've got them working, they are practicing, they are doing everything that you asked them to do, and they are improving, and we're getting closer to contest, and you know, everybody's just kind of getting in a, in a different mode. 
from the very beginning of the year, I bribed my kids for lack of a better word, okay? And I will tell you, I bribed my own children when they were growing up. When my son was in high school, it was very important for me for him to get a scholarship. I paid him $5 for every essay that he wrote that he applied for a scholarship. Because all I could remember hearing other parents say is how hard it was to get their kids to write those essays to apply for those scholarships. And yes, it paid off. We were blessed. He did get a scholarship. So I bribed my students. How did I bribe them? I gave them tickets. These little red carnival tickets. Yes, I bought a roll of those. And as they did packets, depending on how many questions were in these packets, they would get coupons. Now look, they're doing 66 questions and they're only getting seven tickets, okay? They're, they're doing a lot of work for these tickets. Why? Because they could get snacks for those coupons. I had a plastic tub that I bought maybe a box of granola bars and dumped all the granola bars in the tub. Maybe I bought the little bitty bags of chips, little, just little bitty kinds of foods. Teenagers are always hungry. So they would accumulate their tickets and then they would cash them in and they would be able to get a ticket. Maybe you get your academic coordinator to supply you with $30 a year to buy some snacks and, and coupons. It, it goes a long way with the kids. They really, really, and it's not that they really wanted the food. They just kind of like to eat whenever there's an opportunity for them uh, to do it. You know, and maybe that won't work with your kids. You kind of have to find the kids what is motivating to them because not every kid is motivated by the same thing. Uh, we also kept a wall chart and I know this seems probably really elementary but they liked this it was visual their name was written up here and as they did those packets they got a sticker to put on the chart yes these are high school kids but they are they're motivated kids they're they're competitive kids they're goal-oriented kids. They, they have a, a target. They're, they're getting ready to compete. They're getting ready to earn a spot on a team. So this visual was just another way to kind of let them keep track of where they were, getting all those packets completed, uh, where they were in line with what were the other kids doing, how many packets had Mary done, how many packets had Bill done. You know, so there's a lot of competition going on in between, which, you know, that's good. That's kind of how you get better. You got to have that competition or it's probably not going to happen. A lot of kids are interested in pass scores. You know, I kept a spreadsheet from year to year because they want to know, well, how did the team do last year on this invitational meet? How did the team last year do on the district meet? They like to see if they were performing as well as the kids that were competing before them were. So a spreadsheet doesn't take that long to put together. They had a notebook. Once they got on the team, we would get a notebook when it got ready for district. If you made the district UIL accounting team, I gave them a notebook and it was full of brand new packets, getting them ready for the district meet. So we would start all over with a different set of packets for the district meet. They were a little higher level. If we were successful at the district meet and we moved on to the region meet, they got new guts for their notebook and it had packets that were over the region topics because every level that your students advance to the level of difficulty is going up. They have to start practicing at a different level. So more packets, different kinds of material in those packets, a harder level packet, not near as much time to prepare because from district to region, there's not near as many weeks. 
So they have to be committed. One thing you need to be careful of is making sure that when you do get ready to pick your team, that you have commitment. I remember early on in the years, getting the students picked, and then we'd get ready for the district meet was coming up. Oh, I can't go. I have something with such and such. <laughs> I mean, the first time that happened, I thought I was gonna freak out. I'm like, what do you mean you can't go? So learn from that. Whenever I would pick my team as I learned, I would hand them a memo that I asked them to take home. I even got their parents to sign it just because sometimes it was the parent that remembered something ahead of time. It would list the dates of the invitational meets. It would list the dates of the possible district meet that they might compete in if they made the team. It would list the dates of the region meet if they were that successful. It listed the date of the state meet. Some kids knew in the fall. I mean, I had one little girl say, well, you know, can't I do this? And then somebody else go, if I make it to the region meet, and then I could come back in because she was playing volleyball and she knew that she would not be able to go anywhere on a weekend in April for UIL because she would be doing volleyball. But they know a lot of them, they have schedules. So it's really a good idea because you probably are gonna have enough kids that maybe you can give somebody else an opportunity and then that student would be able to have more time to commit to the program. So sometimes it's very wise to do that. We lost one student right before the um, state meet because it was also the weekend of a band spring trip and the parents had already spent money. I mean, the kid didn't want to go to the band thing, but his parents said, yeah, you know, the money's already been spent, so you're going. So it's just something you might want to try to um, keep in mind. You do want to make sure that the students are aware that it's a commitment. You know, this is something that's going to take a team to be really successful. Yes, they compete individually, but they do depend on each other to do well so that they can win and advance as a team. So you want to make sure that they realize that they are committing to something, that this just is, you know, something that they're signing up for just for fun. Uh, getting them to commit, a lot of times when it got closer to district, region, and state meets, we would have a calendar so that they could sign up for, these are their signups, their little scribble initials here because these kids are usually busy kids. They're in different activities or they're in different events or they're working or whatever. So as a coach, I'm one of those crazy people. I was available pretty much, you know, 24 seven. Uh, but I would come in before school or I would come after school and they could sign up if they wanted to go over a test or if they had a packet they wanted to go over. Um, we would just, I would make it possible for them to be able to have the one-on-one -on -one time that they needed in order to be successful for the meets that were coming up. It takes a lot from your kids and it also takes a lot from you. And I know there are lots of things you can use now. We had started using that Remind 101. You know, there are lots of ways to communicate with these kids to remind them of things. So you have to find what works best with uh, your students in order to keep things moving forward and, you know, making sure that they're getting ready, that they're preparing for what's coming up. And then the fun part, because you want to celebrate. You know, it's, it's really easy to get real hung up on practicing and correcting their test and you know trying to get them to put a little bit more time in but it's also important that you take the time to celebrate with them uh, these are some pictures from my classroom now remember i was in this classroom for probably 15 years actually i had to move from one room to the next and that was a nightmare but i hung up everything 
I, I, you know, if we had trophies or plaques that we wanted invitational meets, I found a place to stand them up or to uh, hang them on the wall. Um, we went to state meets, we got t-shirts. I had them autograph the t-shirt. Um, I made posters every year for the team that went to district and went to region and if they went on to state. Um, I would just put pictures through the year. They love to see pictures of themselves up in the classroom. Do a lot of that just to encourage them. This was in the accounting classroom. So their, their teammates saw, uh, or their classmates saw, they all enjoyed seeing the different things. Uh, we would do cookie cakes if they, you know, won. Just try to find little things to do to celebrate their success and just to encourage them to, to continue to work. Just tried really hard to uh, build that confidence in them. We had t-shirts. I know a lot of you order t-shirts for your um, account of your UIL programs. And we did the, we had a great administration. We were able to uh, order t-shirts for the kids to buy every year for whatever meet that we were competing in. Uh, one of my favorite things is getting the t-shirts and getting the kids to autograph. I mean, that has nothing to do with their success, but as a coach, it's a great, great, great memory to have and to, to be able to um, let them write some things on. So lots of different years we did, you know, we do crazy things. We had hats one year. We just tried to find ways to celebrate with the kids, uh, make them feel that they were really part of something. Um, crazy little glasses that Miss Matthews made them wear. I did a lot of things that, you know, as I told my own children when they were growing up, part of my job was to embarrass them. Well, these children were my children, so I found ways to embarrass them as well, but they loved it. They love all the attention. So these, the only thing that I will warn you about is when you start something like this, you're kind of stuck with it because these kids at the end of the year will already be asking you, when are you gonna make our poster? When's our poster gonna go up on the wall? You haven't got our poster up yet, Ms. Matthews. So you have to be careful that, you know, traditions become ingrained and they all expect the things that you've done in the past to continue uh, in the future. But it was fun. And you can tell the posters even got better as time got by because we got nice printers at school. <laughs> so I didn't have to cut and pictures out anymore. We could just print a big poster. So lots of fun, lots of, you know, fun things to do to encourage the kids and to let them know, uh, you know, how proud we are of them. So they like to feel like a rock star is what we used to always say. Uh, and what did we do as a school? Well, I was very blessed in that I worked at a school where our principal, our administration was more than dedicated to our UIL program. So I would encourage you to keep your administration informed about your kids' successes. Share with them whatever you can to let them know what your kids are doing. Uh, send them emails whenever you get back from a meet to let them know. I would send a mass email out to all the staff to let them know what the kids had done because a lot of times if that teacher had that student in her classroom, she would take the time to congratulate him. So you just kind of build morale. The more you share with your administration, the more you share with the other staff members to let them know what's going on. We had a web page on the school district's website. Uh, we were able to publish lots of pictures out there. Uh, articles to the local newspapers, another great way for you to publicize what your kids have been successful at. Uh, probably you have channels that you have to go through that in your district because we finally had to start sending ours to one key person. So you probably need to check and how that's happening in your school district. But most of them do like for you to send in articles because they like to have the publicity in the, the local newspapers. Our school board uh, was a place that we took our kids 
they invited us typically in the spring we would bring the kids that were advancing to region or state depending on what time it was and they would recognize our UIL students we just had an administration that was a firm believer in our UIL program one of the things that we were really blessed with we had a principal who decided he really wanted UIL academics to be really well known in our high school and so every year they would order banners if we were district champion or if we were um, had a team that won the state champions or our accounting team had their own banner there were also banners for each UIL academic event and any kid that had won uh, an advance to region or state's name was on those banners and these all hung in the common area of our school district I mean of our high school and it was great publicity the kids loved to see them um, so our district was really really good uh, with that and at the beginning of the year I, I kind of skipped over this our principal actually held a rally uh, in our auditorium probably early October and uh, you actually had to be invited to come to the rally. So we would get the staff to send in two or three names of students that they thought might be good UIL academic competitors. They would get an invitation and they would be able to come to the assembly. So as the years went by, it became you know, a coveted thing to get invited to the UIL uh, rally. We also did a banquet at the end of the year. We um, would invite the students and their parents and um, we would have them come and we would recognize the kids that had participated in UIL academics. We would have dinner and you know, have a video plan of, of all the pictures from out the year. So that was another thing that we were able to do. The t-shirts, letter jackets, which I'm sure a lot of people probably have that in their district, the kids could earn a letter jacket if they were going to be um, did whatever they needed to do. Uh, where am I going? Here we go. So one of the things I think that made our team successful is that there we tried to create unity as much as possible. Our team members worked together. The students, when we had practice, you know, there's only one of you and there's a lot of them. So we would work, the kids would work together. They can teach each other tricks. Uh, they talk in their own kind of language. So it's really good to have them work with each other. Uh, create that friendly competition as much as possible. It needs to be fun. Um, you need them competing against each other because competition just increases, you know, everybody's capabilities. It's just a really good thing. Uh, coaches need to have a reality check with realistic expectations. Um, again, you have to remember that their kids are going to be involved in different things. And so you, you have to be careful that you maybe don't overstep boundaries. I know I had one student one year before the state meet said, uh, you just don't understand what you're asking of us. And I said, well, you're right, because I'm not asking anything of you. You asked to be a part of this and you're the ones who have set up all these evening practices, not your coach. I said, but you are asking a lot of yourself. So you kind of have to watch that they don't even take on more than they really should be taking on. And if I didn't mention it before, you definitely need your administration support. Do what you can to get your principals involved. Um, Keep them informed of what your students' successes are. Um, just ask them to be a part of it. We almost had an administrator at every meet that we attended. I mean, either invitational district or region, someone usually showed up, which spoke a lot to the kids. Um, invite your school board members to your banquet if you have one at the end of the year. Usually somebody will come just to show the support, but your administration if the team if your kids are working together and your coaches are working together and your administration's working together 
you just increase the opportunity for your program to be a success. And yes, there have been many medals throughout the years, and there have been lots and lots of um, memories that have been made along the way. UIL was a huge, huge highlight of my teaching career. The, the relationships that I built with the students that I was blessed to work with will never ever be able to replace probably by anything else that uh, I will ever do in my life. I'm very thankful and I'm very blessed and that's about the best way that I can describe the years that I was able to work uh, with UIL academics. So with that said, I think I'm finished. Um, anybody have something they want to throw at me? We have a question or two in the, the box. Um, anybody else who has questions or comments, please feel free to add those in. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, this one is uh, a question about recruiting students. Do you have problems finding people who want to do the activity? So did you have your whole class do the packets and wall charts, or did you, ask, did you just ask the people who were interested? Well, at the beginning, we did some drills in the classroom from some of the packets to really introduce the kids to what UIL looks like, because a lot of them have never even seen a UIL test. So doing like breaking some of the packets up into drills that maybe you could use in your classroom kind of acclimates them a little bit to what it would be like. Did not do a lot of UIL in the classroom other than if the packet fit with the chapter, then we might use some of the problems. Um, and yes, it is hard at the beginning to get the interest level up. I, I don't discount that, that one bit, but even if you only find two or three kids that first year, and if you just work with them, it takes a time to build that program within your accounting class. And you will be able to build it, but you do have to realize that it, it, it takes several years to get that interest level. You can get that one kid that can maybe win at the invitational and come back with his medal and kind of make a big deal of that in the classroom. I mean, we did, we always made a big deal in the classroom the weeks after the meet so that the kids in there would realize it. But um, it's hard to do a whole lot of UIL uh, in the regular coursework, but you could definitely use some of the packets for drills just to kind of introduce them to what's going on. Great. Uh, another question, do you have an, an idea of how I could recruit for accounting team if I don't have an accounting class? Whoa, <laughs> I was always amazed that we would have kids that uh, from other schools, because we hosted the district meet uh, quite often and in, in even the region meet. Uh, there were schools that had kids they, that, I have no idea how they were able to get those kids into accounting other than someone probably had a parent that was an accountant and had introduced their child to it, but to get a student interested in accounting and not to even have an accounting class, that's a pretty tough road to hoe, but, but I know people have done it. I, I don't know if it just happened by chance or what. I, I really don't know. I don't, I don't know what I would do in a situation like that. I mean, you might go to your, um, your math teachers and find some kids that are strong in math that are interested maybe in going and getting a business degree you know, that's a door to open up and maybe tell them, well, why don't you come see me and let's look at the accounting book and you might get a kid that was interested in that way. Good, thanks. We have a general question about what are the plans for the competition for this next year? Um, well, <laughs> currently, uh, the uh, word on the street is UIL is we're going ahead as planned with our calendar and our competition. And we will make those adjustments as we uh, have to and need to if we if we do. So uh, I'm just hoping we don't have to do too many or it doesn't get too crazy. But we're going to uh, certainly do all we can to provide our, our events for our, our students this coming year. So rest assured that and we'll keep trying what we uh, can do to keep the uh, make sure we have the competitions this coming year. Despite all the craziness that we're all living through, especially you teachers who... Uh, are now uh, thinking you're going to have to plan a remote lesson and a in line in person lesson. So mm -hmm. hopefully it all works out. We're with you. Um, another question for you though, um, Susan: Are your students who advance to state accounting students 
uh, accounting, are they second and third year students or your first year students? Okay. Um, a lot of the students that I took to invitationals and district and region were first year students. Uh, we, I, I learned early on that most of the kids that are in an accounting program have chosen to be in there. So you can set the level of that class. I pushed my accounting students because they love to be pushed, not just UIL students, all my, all my accounting students. And we, we would literally get through with the full accounting cycle for a service business, payroll, bank reconciliation, and the full accounting cycle for a merchandising business before we went to district. So you just need to really learn that you can push your accounting class. It's just, they catch on, it, they just, those kids are just wired different, I guess. But yes, you can take accounting one students to all levels and you will have success. Second year students, of course, they have a little bit of an advantage because they've already finished all the first year. Now they're working in second year material, which is basically where your region and state concepts are developed. But um, you still will have students that are self-motivated in your accounting one class that will learn the region and state material ahead of time so that they can be competitive for it. But yes, you definitely can do it with first year students. Uh, and then you can continue on, hopefully, <clears throat> getting them back a second year. Well, it's looking like we are cleared on our questions, and we've answered everything we've gotten so far. Yeah. So I want to take the opportunity to thank you, Susan, for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge, some great information that's applicable to many other events, not just accounting. Some of the ways you motivate students and encourage them, and that administration support is you so pointed out is so, so important. And uh, many times that's just us being advocates for ourselves and making sure the administration knows what you have going on. So thanks Very for good. sharing all of the great tidbits and information. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, we appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. And everyone, thanks for joining us today. Thank you all. Have a good summer and good luck with change.